Since I was a boy, I hate and feared little rooms, closets, caves. Danny, you dug 17 tunnels, oh, over 17 because tunnels. Because I must get out. I hide the fear and I dig. But tomorrow night in the tunnel with all those men, I'm afraid maybe this time I will lose my head and ruin the escape for everybody. That's what I do now. Roger Ebert once remarked, every great film should seem new every time you see it. And with each new viewing of The Great Escape, there is always something new to be found. It always sets out to surprise you. And no, not just the memorable and iconic imagery that is cemented in popular culture, the motorcycle stunts, the glove and baseball, the theme tune, and unforgettable quotes. Good luck. Thank you. The Great Escape is more than just an assortment of recognisable iconography and popular anthems. Underneath the rousing Hollywood spectacle, there is a profound and provocative beating heart to proceedings. Enshrined within are pure touches of subtle cinematic genius and powerful themes that revitalise and refresh the viewing experience with each time. But I never considered The Great Escape a war story. Oh. It's true that it, the story was caused by the war, mm -hmm. and it's true that it's about men who were prisoners of war. But the, the film is, is a story of courage and of gallantry. The film is based on former POW Paul Brickhill's 1950s book of the same name, a non-fiction first-hand account of the mass escape from Stalaglov III. The film's characters are based on real men, and in some cases are composites of several people. The film tells the story of Roger Bartlett, or Big X, who attempts a mass breakout of 250 prisoners of war to add us, confound and confuse the enemy to the best of my ability. That's true. What separates the film from its contemporaries, such as The Dirty Dozen, Where Eagles Dare, Kelly's Heroes and Von Ryan's Express, is the way the film uses tone and atmosphere to consistently keep the viewer on the edge of their seat, switching constantly from triumph to tragedy in the blink of an eye. The film transitions from scenes of touching levity and humour to scenes of intense tragedy and emotional sadness with great ease. The Great Escape is ultimately a battle between the stubborn optimism and heroic nature of these men versus the harsh and dire reality of their situation and the overwhelming odds that tower over them. From the outset, it is established that these men, these group of troublemakers, have been placed in an inescapable camp. This is a new camp. It has been built to hold you and your men. It is organized to incorporate all we have learned of security measures. And in me, you will not be dealing with a common jailer but with a staff officer personally selected for the task by the Luftwaffe High Command. We have in effect put all our rotten eggs in one basket, and we intend to watch this basket carefully. Very wise. To assess how the film achieves this fine balance of tone, it is important to examine the visual style and construction of the film itself. The director, the underrated John Sturgis, rarely uses close-ups, keeping the characters enclosed in wide and medium shots, keeping all the cast members in single frames. The film features an international ensemble cast, and the omission of intense close-ups ensures that the film achieves an egalitarian focus on the cast itself. No character has priority over the other. What Sturgis aspires to achieve with this visual construction is a sense that the characters are interlinked and dependent in achieving their central aim, to escape, but more importantly, to escape together. And due to this burning need to get out, they made it themselves blackmailers, forgers, thieves, tunnel diggers. I, I thought that was a great story. Perhaps the single greatest component in achieving these masterful transitions of tonality is Elmer Bernstein's rousing, beautiful and nuanced score that is able to achieve both sorrowful tones of haunting foreboding and triumphant marches that inspire unrelenting optimism and persistence. It's easy to dismiss the soundtrack as gimmicky or anthemic. However, this demeans the subtlety and sensitivity of some of the more delicate scenes in the film. For these scenes, Bernstein undercuts the emotion in the story by using woodwind instruments such as the flute to perfectly orchestrate the moral and psychological intricacies of the characters. It's almost a complete back and forth between these two conflicting moods and tones a constant musical skirmish between the vibrant and spirited pieces in opposition to the looming, uneasy and tragic scores throughout, reminding us of the true reality of it all. A key scene that evokes the ultimate goal of these prisoners and their moral and psychological viewpoint is when the reason behind the escape is discussed. It is the sworn duty of all officers to try to escape. 
If they can't, it is their sworn duty to cause the enemy to use an inordinate number of troops to guard them, and their sworn duty to harass the enemy to the best of their ability. Now this could obviously be seen as a very patriotic standpoint, celebrating the undefeatable quality of the soldier's mindset, but it also taps into the very human desire for freedom and the need to return to one's home. Yet the true drama and joy comes with how the men work in solidarity of their mutual objective and help each other in the face of adversity, whether it's how Willie helps Danny cope with his crippling claustrophobia or how Henley sticks up for Blythe. In this scene, Flight Lieutenant Blythe, played by Donald Pleasance, has been gradually losing his sight as a result of progressive myopia. Squadron leader Bartlett, played by Richard Attenborough, informs Blythe that he cannot be a part of the escape attempt as a blind man is a risk to the whole escape organisation. You can't go. I mean, I can't allow it. Why? Because you can't see your hand in front of your face. You'll be caught before you've got 10 yards. The blocking in this scene provides a startling yet subtle insight into the power struggle and dynamic of these men within an enclosed space. Sturgis attempts to capture the conflicted mentality and disagreement in the positioning and movement of the characters. The two men both stand opposite one another, emphasising their conflict and opposing views. Gradually, Bartlett's harsh and unremitting logic overpowers Bly's naive insistence and a defeated Blythe takes a seat on the bunk. Henley, thus far a passive observer in the scene, is shown lying on the bunk, overseeing the action. Midway through, he stands to counter Bartlett, arguing that Bartlett, who is wanted by the Gestapo, is as big a risk to the organisation as any man. Hendley, played by James Garner, takes it upon himself to be Blythe's guide in the escape. Thus, the tone of the scene switches instantly to a subtle... Come on, Roger. We all know the score here. Yeah, at least, most of us do. Your idea of this escape is to... Start another front to foul up the Germans behind the lines. All right, that's fine, that's fine. But once we get past that barbed wire, once we have them looking all over Germany for us, that mission is accomplished. Afterwards, we have some ideas of our own. You mean getting home? Like to your family and children? That's right. Good God, man, do you really believe I haven't thought about that too? I'm sure you have. I know Colin has. Eventually, Hendley overpowers Bartlett by stubbornly remarking that he will be Bly's guide in the escape, leaving Bartlett with no choice but to agree to this proclamation and retreat respectably. Hendley ignores not only the reality of the situation, but also Bartlett's understandable concerns. Instead, relying on his own positive and idealistic outlook, seeing not weakness or liability in his blind friend, only his strength and attitude, evoking Henley's affirmative, persistent and confident nature. Together, they are stronger, even if it does all end in failure. I'm sorry I fouled things up. That's all right. Thank you for getting me out. In an earlier scene, the prisoners are celebrating American independence with a home-brewed moonshine concoction blended by Henley and Hilt. For the benefit of their captors, the prisoners appear to be celebrating the 4th of July. Whilst it is acknowledged surreptitiously by several characters that they are subtextually and hopefully celebrating their imminent escape to freedom via their tunnel, fondly nicknamed Tom. It is arguably the most upbeat and joyful scene in the film, our heroes seemingly forgetting their prisoner status for a brief moment. However, the scene turns disastrous when the Germans accidentally discover the tunnel opening in one of the barracks, the prisoners' celebrations turning to horror upon this unexpected revelation. One of the most intriguing characters throughout the first half of the film is Ives, a prisoner who perfectly embodies the psychological struggle this constant battle between hope and despair can have and the toll it can take. Losing all faith and sanity, Ives decides to take the opportunity to climb the unsupervised fence. Sturgis dramatises this loss of hope visually by intercutting with several scenes of the prisoner's celebration and drunken merriment, cleverly deflecting from the foreboding of what is to come. And the subtle performances and changes in reactions throughout The Great Escape say more than a piece of dialogue ever could. It's almost as if these prisoners are actors in their own right, playing a part of the unbridled, unflinching and unrelenting soldier. Seeing their reactions change when these men are suddenly left alone speaks volumes. It's as if for one second they cannot bear to show their true vulnerability, their fears, their woes, keeping at all times a stiff upper lip and a brave face. Their smiles, childish jokes and tomfoolery are their armour, and their optimism is their weapon. Because the very worst that can happen to these men is not being thrown in the cooler, 
being stripped of their belongings or having their escapes foiled. It's the idea of letting their enemy know the true effect these constant defeats and thwarted attempts are having on them. It's the constant battle of never letting your guard down, never showing your weakness or unveiling the tortured soul beneath. They will continue to scheme, cause mayhem and escape because if they were to give up your hopeless attempts to escape, that would be admitting defeat and these men will not be defeated. Even the famous motorcycle sequence displays this notion perfectly because whilst on the surface the setting of Nazi occupied Germany and the tremendous probability of capture against him, Captain Virgil Hilt should have an increasingly bleak outlook, yet nothing can tether his brash, defiantly optimistic and colourful spirits. Hilt's attempted motorcycle jump isn't just a showboating, thrill-seeking stunt, it encapsulates the very essence of the film itself. It's Hiltz's foolish yet admirable confidence to think that he can make the jump, and his inability to see any other option than success. The grandeur of the gesture is a middle finger to the monumental and menacing forces against him. Nothing is going to stop these men, no matter how much they are beaten down or caged. Even the use of his baseball is a constant motif throughout the story, beginning with his first escape attempt merely minutes after arriving at the camp, reflecting his playful and mischievous nature, to playing with the ball in the cooler as a way of denying his predicament and rejecting the very concept of failure. The baseball itself is a symbol of the ferociously ostentatious, informal and patriotic America Hiltz comes from, compared to the stern and extremely strict nature of the Germans. It's a metaphor for both Hiltz and his comrades' perseverance and tenacity against the idea of failure, or conceding to their enemy. And with the film's ending, the simple sound of the baseball bouncing drives home this idea ingeniously. In one of the final scenes, Hendley is returned to the camp after recapture. Here, the moral contradiction of the film's ending is addressed, as Hendley questions whether the escape attempt and ensuing provocation on the Germans was worth the 50 prisoners of war that were executed as a result. Roger's idea was to get back at the enemy the hardest way he could, mess up the works. From what we've heard here, I think he did exactly that. Do you think it was worth the price? It depends on your point of view, Hendley. Here the film leaves the question open to the viewer to decide. Was the escape attempt worth the eventual mass murder that occurred? In essence, the film poses a more philosophical question regarding freedom at the expense of loss of life. It's easy to see why the popularity of The Great Escape has endured from 1963 to the present day. The film is a masterful example of the use of direction, editing, music and acting to create ingenious shifts in tone, extraordinary suspense, cinematic thrill and grand escapism. However, if you look more closely, you'll find there is another extraordinary layer to be found underneath. Thematically, the film contains a deep and moving humanity that emphasises the extraordinary feats that people can achieve through cooperation, refusal to surrender and a devoted persistence to achieving freedom, shining a light on the uncontrolled and relentless perseverance of the human spirit. It's a subtle reminder of a history nearly forgotten and as the director himself states, There was only one common denominator among all these men from every country in the world, every professional in the world, and that was to escape. And uh, you could say on the head of a pin that it's the story of why our side won. I like that.